Hi friends, welcome back to Building in a Small Town. My guest today is George LaCava of Nevada Barbell. Nevada Barbell is where fitness is approachable with powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, and everything in between. In this episode, you'll learn about George's career in the Air Force that took him all around the world, his brief stint as a trained meat cutter and butcher shop owner, and his unexpected and unintentional journey to gym ownership. I feel like there was a ton of ground that we didn't cover, but I really enjoyed this conversation and I know you will too. Before we get into the episode, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for listening and ask you to make sure that you're subscribed on whatever your listening platform. While you're at it, if you could also drop a quick rating and review, that's a simple free way to support the show and it helps others find the show. Thank you again and let's get into it. Welcome to Building in a Small Town, where we're talking to entrepreneurs, community leaders, policymakers, and more to find out how they're building things in small towns. I'm your host, Shelby Smith. Welcome back to the Building in a Small Town podcast. Today I am joined by a face that I haven't seen in quite a long time because I have not been in the gym in a very long time. Uh, George LaCava of Nevada Barbell. So thanks for making the trip over and coming to sit down and chat with me. You're welcome. It's good to be here. Yeah. <laughs> you stole my thunder. I was going to say it's been a while since I've seen you. <laughs> um, I just have a tendency to do that. I figured I'd front run you on it. Um, so anyways, you are, like I said, the owner of Nevada Barbell, which is, would you just call it a barbell club? Would you call it a gym? It's a little bit of everything. So the barbell mm-hmm. club is pretty appropriate. All right, we've got power lifters, Olympic weightlifters, people that do CrossFit workouts, and then everything in between. Yeah, I was going to say, it has definitely morphed, especially over the last 18 to 24 months. Biggest changes for sure in that time frame. But we've been going since 2016. Yeah, Has so it been that long? Yeah, it's been a long journey. Holy moly. I guess I didn't realize that it had been since 2016, which that's year on year eight now. Right. Does it feel like almost a decade? It does because we've moved six. This is the <laughs> sixth location. <laughs> well, I was going to say third time's the charm, but maybe it's just three times two. Well, we've got the double charm. charm then. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, so anyways, I but I normally start people way back when so that's where we're gonna start with you too you did not grow up in iowa i did not far from it you are originally from cleveland ohio cleveland sometimes i do need that modifier well that's one of those ohio idaho and iowa nobody seems to know where the three are ohio yeah (laughs) where they grow the potatoes (laughs) exactly Yeah, that seems about right. Um, so you grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and you were also not an only child. Correct. Yeah, just outside of Cleveland on the east side, and I am the oldest of six. Oldest of six. How right. many did you all boys, all girls? No, mixed? it's me, four girls, and a brother. Okay. Yeah, my brother and I are the bookends. I was going to say, is your brother the, the youngest? He is. Yeah, he was just in town this past weekend, which was fun because it... You know, when you grow up with siblings, you you tend to point out each other's differences. Mm-hmm. And so it's fun when one of them comes into town and I brought him to the gym and everybody was like, oh, you guys look exactly the same. We look at each other like, do we? <laughs> <laughs> Are we even related? Yeah. And so was he, was he, were you the typical oldest child and he yes. was the typical baby? Yeah. Yeah. In every way? In pretty much every way you can imagine. In a typical midwest family yeah Yeah. you know by the time i was eight i was doing dishes and folding laundry and and changing diapers so yeah pretty typical i think is there a large age gap between the six no eight years jeez between (laughs) six of you yeah holy cow so you're all basically irish twins yeah i think the 18 months is probably the biggest yeah yeah. (laughs) your poor mother 
Holy cow. Yeah. I didn't realize that. So your next... She talks fondly of it, though. She... She yeah. enjoyed it. That's what they wanted. They, they wanted a big family. She's one of four. My dad is one of 11. Okay. Yeah. So big families all around. My dad is one of 10 and his dad is one of 17. So um, basically any family function, any family reunion <laughs> is a large affair. I imagine yours. Right. Has yeah. So my oldest niece graduated high school this year and her graduation party is this weekend so i'll drive back for it but yeah right off the bat the party starts at somewhere around 25 people (laughs) that'll take me a second to do the math but right yeah no matter what yeah Yeah. and that's it's funny when willie and i got married in the courthouse and i was talking to my mom about doing a you know doing a party or something she's like well do you want to just kind of keep it small like friends and family and i'm like i'm sorry (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> At what point is any family function small? Like, yeah, right. there is no making it a small affair. Um, okay, so you grew up in Cleveland, part of a big family. Mm-hmm. Um, are your parents from Cleveland? They are, yeah. Born and raised? Born and raised. They, let's see, they grew up about two blocks from each other. Oh. My mom actually used to babysit for my dad's younger brothers. Early yeah. audition. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think they got married three months after their first day or engaged some something like that, but it was it was pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. they'd just grown up around each other. So right, I was gonna say they'd known each other for quite a t- quite a long time, and that makes sense. Also, sort of a different time, shall we say, a few years ago. Where, well, right. You know, it's just it was more common to have a shorter courtship, but three months is pretty quick. It seems like. Um, Okay, so then how do you get from, so Cleveland, you graduate from high school. Do you go to college? I did. Straight away? Yeah, I went to Ohio State. The, I did the. the. See, I don't ever put that <laughs> the in there because the person I am talking to will always, without fail, put in the the. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> the Ohio State University. Uh, well, and I don't know who ruined it then for alumni because at some point the Ohio State became a thing. It had to have been somebody on your side that did it. Well, it used to be a, it used to be a running joke in the law school on campus. Okay. Because I think one of their one of their projects was how would you copyright the right? And I think and I can never remember if this is a real article or not because around April Fool's Day it comes out every year. Ohio State copyrights the but it may, they may have actually done something like, like that recently. Yeah, that seems like a law school which, thing to do. <laughs> but which is, a, which is annoying, as a, I suppose I'm a more casual fan. Mm. <laughs> Having been away for such a long time. Fair enough. I'm glad that everybody else like razzes you about that, though. You have to expect it. Yeah, naturally. So you graduate from there. What did you study? Computer engineering. Yeah, and then so the day I graduated, and I did ROTC, I did Air Force ROTC. Okay. So the day I graduated was the day I commissioned. And then from there, I went to tech school in Mississippi, and then my first assignment. Where in Mississippi? Biloxi. Okay. So my brother was in Columbus, because that was where they did their initial pilot school. Missouri. Mississippi. Really? Yeah. Seabus. Okay. Yeah, Columbus. That's where they... um, so after he left the academy, I believe that was when you get a pilot slot, that was his first stop was Columbus where they did like the T6s and the that's that is literally yeah. the first plane they put them in. Right. And then they get sent on a different track. So either you got sent like cargo or fighter. Oh, right. And they do that based on graduation position because you can put in your preference, right? And then yes. It's- you put However, in, your preference falls where you graduate. Yes. Whether or not you get it, right? I think. Something um, like that. Yeah, this was already 11 years ago as he went through. I know it's over a decade, which is wild. Um, oh, no, it was maybe longer than that. It seems like it was 2011. Longer than that. So, But, yeah, so he was in Columbus as well. So you went to tech school in Biloxi. Correct. How was Biloxi? Well, we had a good time. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, you know casinos and more or less much more freedom than we'd ever had before right you're getting you're getting paychecks Mm -hmm. you go to you know you go to class for eight hours a day but 
We had a good, we had a good time. <laughs> Even at that. Yeah, yeah, we had a good time. Tech school was fun. Yeah, then my first assignment after that was Korea. Yeah. Okay. And how long were you in Korea? And for a year. That, you, that assignment was a year. Okay. What do you do at tech school? Like, do you, do they, what do you do? So back then, and I'm, I can't speak for tech school now, I, I would imagine it's changed quite a bit in the last 25 years, but it was a lot of, you know, computer based learning, right? How to run a server, right? Some basic leadership stuff. And, you know, what systems were available in the Air Force that we might touch as communications officers. But a lot of base networking type stuff. Okay, so it's just a little bit of everything. Um, And so then was the intention with you coming out, does that mean then from a tech standpoint that you run a base essentially? Like you, you (laughs) know, like... Not not quite, right? We, We aren't expected to be the technical experts as officers, right? They just... We're, we're there to manage, right? Hopefully lead, yes. but generally manage, right? Just make sure nothing nothing's going wrong, right? So in Korea, yeah, I was, I was on the base network team, 51st Communication Squadron. And there were about 120 people total in that unit between enlisted and contractors. We had civilian contractors over there too. And that group of people ran the network for the entire peninsula. Okay. Right? So Osan was the, yeah, it was the central hub for all communications, whether it was telephones or networks or you know, like at Kells and stuff for the flight line. Mm-hmm. My brother was at Osan. My niece was born there. Oh. Um, yeah. That would have been God Della's. She's almost a decade old now too, so it'd have been eight years ago or so. So yeah. it's a uh, it's funny because you do uh, occasionally run across people that have served in the same place as you did. I did have a a gym member come through for a short time who was actually at in the fifty first communication squadron, which is funny because I haven't I hadn't met one in the wild before. Yeah, yeah. but not at the same time. No, you were there. We're okay, not at the same time. so you were only there for a year, right? Um, and then. Where do they send you? And then from there, I did two years at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque. Hmm. Right. So mostly desk side support did kind of wrote the information security plans for the Air Force Inspection Agency. Okay. That must be. So strangely enough, coincidentally enough, my brother's next assignment post. Yeah. I was on was Al Magordo from no. Mexico. So <laughs> it, it must be, they must be like, everybody we send to Korea, let's send to New Mexico. Next. Tell me he went to Germany next. No, Germany was first. <laughs> okay. Um, so it was Germany, then Korea, then uh, Al Magordo, and then Rhode Island for war school. Okay. And then the Pentagon and now Japan. So he was all with four kids. That's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> It's a lot. It's a busy career. Yes. But so anyways, okay. So you're, you're in Albuquerque writing. Is that for the whole Air Force that you wrote? No, for? just for that specific agency. Okay. So the inspection agency goes around and inspects everybody else for compliance. What was that Air like? Force regulations. Uh, I mean, it's different for sure because the agency was made up mostly of field grade officers. So majors, lieutenant colonels, colonels. And as a young lieutenant, you know, it could it could seem a little overwhelming because your support is suddenly a group of people that you really don't have a lot of exposure to in the normal military setting. Where you're right in your chain of command you might have one, two, three above you, but mm-hmm. as far as a group like a big group of people that you're supporting, it was it was a lot. But it was it was pretty laid back. It was it was easy. It was a fun assignment. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially writing the rules for everybody, kind of, sort of. At least right, writing the inspection part. And, and it does. And it, it got down to the point where, well, who inspects the inspection agency? Which is where it came down to me. Hey, we need to, we need some internal regulations to follow for ourselves, too. Yeah. Here you go. Write these. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're else. pretty good at technical writing. Right. And for you, did you then like go hands-on and inspect people? I got brought along on a couple of them, mostly as communication support. Okay. 
I was going to say, it makes sense that somebody writing the protocol would perhaps see it in action at some point, but yeah, maybe not. Maybe that's a little too logical for Mother Air Force. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a government organization. Um, so were you in general, did you enjoy the Air Force experience? Oh yeah. I loved it. I really did. What part? Uh, I, you know, and this gets a little, everybody kind of says the same thing, but I mean, the camaraderie is really hard to match Mm -hmm. because I mean, regardless of how good a time you're having at some point, you still are locked into the military way. But to have that group of people that's going through it with you, it's it's hard to beat that. Yeah. You can all commiserate together yeah. about how stupid some of the stuff right? you do is. Shared misery. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shared misery definitely loves company. Um, okay, so you're in Albuquerque, and then where do you go after Albuquerque? And then from Albuquerque, I got what I considered my dream job as a communications officer in the Air Force was to go to Germany, Ramstein Air Force Base, first combat com. Okay. For me, yeah, just wanting to do something that seemed a little more action-oriented in the Air Force as a communications officer, yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, because, and uh, what year, like, what time period was this at this time? Uh, Germany was 2005 to 2007. Okay, so we are in active, like, this is all post-9. Did you go ROTC before I did. Yeah. 9-11? no. Uh, yes, actually. I was going to say, yeah, I don't... 97 I, to 2002. Holy when, cow, yeah. I know. It's been a while. Yeah. Um. And so originally when you went ROTC, was it just because it would pay for college? Yeah. You know, initially, I think uh, growing up with two grandfathers that served in World War II, and uh, the one I was closest to, my mom's dad, having been a pilot, you know, just listening to it growing up, I think I, I was really interested in being a pilot, and mm-hmm. that was my that was my first idea, uh, with wanting to go initially to a service academy, right? Coming out of coming out of high school, it's you know, what do you want to do? I'm like, well, maybe I want to try to try a service academy. I was really itching to get out of Cleveland. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I think I think back about it now and comparing it to, you know, the way information is available to everybody now, right? If you want to go to a school, you Google it and, you know, you bring up the application process and you have all the information you want, right, at your fingertips. And I think back to 96, 97, and when I said that, and my mom just making phone calls, so many phone calls, they'd figure out, well, how do you even start that process? Well, and so did you did you go down that path of applying to the service academy? I did, yeah. Because um, that, got, people who don't know, like, that has to start your junior year at the latest it's, to even be able to get a shot. Yeah, it's a lot because you have to, I mean, not only do you have to go through the regular college application process, but you have to do, you have to do your physical tests, right? You have to interview with officers that are assigned to recruit for the academies you have to get a congressional nomination yeah so i went down that whole path got got all my ducks lined up and then got waitlisted did you apply to all of them or did you no just just to the air force academy Uh, okay but then i ended up so along the way you know one of the things that they recommended was also apply for rotc scholarships so i was fortunate enough to get a full ride it was but it was very specific it was to ohio state the Ohio State University in computer engineering. Oh. Because at the time the Air Force was short on communications officers. Mm. So this was a very specific path that they were trying to push people in. And I had the you know, I had the high school grades to, to get to get it. Yeah. Needs of the Air Force. Right. Steers, so steers a lot. Yeah. Shortening the st- <laughs> an already long story after my first quarter at Ohio State. It was kind of why would I? I'm gonna I'm gonna come out, I'm gonna come out on the other end of this like an officer too. Why would I want to put myself through all this stuff at the academy? But yeah, yeah. So that's, that's how I ended up doing that. So my brother got his pilot's license when he was 17 at okay. Haps or whatever, um, and there was another kid in Nevada that also got his pilot's license like the same time he did, and he my brother went academy. And Lance went ROTC, okay. and they both ended up, right. you know, commissioning. And I'm pretty sure Lance ended up 
pilot as well. But it's you end up in the same spot, if you will. They say unofficially, I think, that like Academy, you maybe get a better shot at a pilot spot, but I don't know if that's actually true. I don't, I don't know if that's true, I but there is certainly... Um, as you get higher There's a little up, bit of, of prestige, right? Yes. Having the ring. As you, For sure. As you get higher up, and yeah. I, maybe it matters more politically as you're going up in the ranks and the longer your career is and everything else, but... I don't know. I look at it that ROTC and Academy they end up in the same. Yeah, the they same they spot. do they do have better opportunities for different summer programs. Like they do they do a survival and evasion school. Yes. Right. They do. You can get your gliding wings. Right. You can do jump school. They they do have a lot of those opportunities that are just presented to them. Mm-hmm. But I was fortunate enough because I was a contracted cadet, which means I I did technically enlist. When I got to Ohio State, mm-hmm. but your enlistment is serving out your ROTC contract. Right. But because I was contracted, I was able to get out to the academy a couple of summers and do a couple of those programs. So, I mean, it was a, it was just a really good experience. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. Um, okay. So you are in Albuquerque and then you go to uh, Ramstein and you're actually feel like you're yeah. in the but, heat of things. Right. I was still living in a hotel. I hadn't even gotten an apartment yet. And they sent me off to Albania and Macedonia. Interesting. Yeah. How was that? Different, <laughs> right? Way different. Even, uh, I think I was, I had enough experience doing a year in Korea where you kind of, you get over the culture shock pretty quick. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Albania and Macedonia, you know, still to this day, the best risotto I've had is in Albania. Really? Yeah. There's a lot of Italian immigrants went over to Albania. In Albania. Yeah. The only thing I think of when I think of Albania is taken. <laughs> Mar- well, it does take a certain set of skills to do a good risotto. So. <laughs> it does. Um, okay. So how long, and were you just doing communications in? Yeah, they do a bit. There's a big joint communications exercise. And so there were a number of these small temporary duties or mini deployments to go kind of set all this stuff up. Okay. And as I say on the pilot side, they do those a lot as well Mm -hmm. where they'll go do the training with Poland. And when my brother was in Germany, he was at, um, God, now I can't even think of it. Um, Spangdalem. Oh, sure. That's where he was. Um, cause that's uh, the 16 base. I don't know if they have them at, do they have 16s at Ramstein? Ramstein's like the big one. Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't should know. know this. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, but Spangdalem is where he was, which was like this little bitty base. Um, but they would go to Poland a lot and, you know, do training with them right. for later. So it's interesting to know that they do you do that on the communication side, which why wouldn't you? Yeah. You know, it's a... Because every, and every country has a different communication system. So it's mm-hmm. making sure it, everybody knows at any time how to make them talk yeah Yeah. to each other right most importantly interesting okay so you're how long are you over in germany slash albania and macedonia for Uh, well i was in germany total two years Mm -hmm. yeah albania and macedonia just you know quick week or two each place they were temporary change of yeah it's just that you know every every country would send their representatives and you go and basically you need to have the technical specs for the equipment that you're going to bring to the exercise and it I mean, it takes, it's a big six month planning process. Right. And then it gets, each meeting gets hosted at a different country that's going to participate. Cool. So then after Germany, then what? Well, after Germany, that was it. And that, because that was how many years in? Well, so that would have been five and a half. Yeah. Five and a half, not including your ROTC? No. So then. Does that make sense? Usually, you made it to the ten-year mark, essentially. Uh, well, so five and a half active duty. You okay. kind of you start splitting hairs when you start counting your inactive reserve. Well, and so time. I, I think at the academy they're technically active duty when they start. I don't know. Now I have no idea. But I think were you required to be in a certain amount of time? I guess with the ROTC right. thing, four years. Okay. Yeah. 
which I think is the same, might be five coming out of the academy. And then did you have to serve additional for tech school then? You probably didn't. No, it was just a, it was a decision point because like I said, that assignment was what I had considered my, my dream assignment. I liked being operational, yeah. right? Because we were, we were deploying all the time, which was fun. But the, you know, I guess kind of the downside of the, the officer track is they want you to follow, you know, a very specific career pyramid. And it was getting to that point where, okay, you got to go to squadron officer school. You need to go do a stint at the Pentagon. And it was just, it was a lot to process. It wasn't quite what I had envisioned my career path being. Right. And then, you know, I'd been away from home for coming up on 10 years and my eldest sister was about to have her first kid and it there was a lot of I don't you know how much family stuff did I want to miss I felt I already felt like I was missing out on a lot you know coming from a big family and we we all stayed pretty close yeah so it was a hard decision but yeah you know, I decided to separate at that point and and back home move on to other things yeah so you said the Ramstein that was your dream position essentially mm-hmm. what did it end up in practice it was okay yeah well, that's good we had yeah, it was good. I mean, got traveled all over the world, got to play with really cool toys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and the, the reason I ask that is because I feel like there's a lot of people that are like, this would be my dream job, and then they get into it, and they're like, oh, never mind. This yeah. is not what I thought. Well, yeah, yeah, it helps. The people that you're surrounded by helps, too. Sure. You know, a couple of them I still keep in contact with. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so you get out in 2007, mm-hmm. is that right? And then you move back to Ohio. Yeah, and what... Yeah, the hard part, right? It's a, I think it's a tough transition for, for anybody, right? Uh, you basically promised the world, right? No, you can get out, you can do anything. Anything you want. And the world f- is your oyster. Five months, I got one interview. Oh, damn. Trying to stay in Cleveland, right? Because that was the, that was the whole idea. And were you interviewing for like? I was applying to anything, like construction management hospital security management jobs, whatever I could think of to apply to. So not necessarily like the computer science. No. And you know, one of the things that I knew is I was not at all interested in doing it. Right. Because, you know, as a (laughs) communications officer in the air force, I, it wasn't, you know, I'm not doing it. I wasn't sitting there. Well, I guess I was occasionally making email accounts in active directory, but yeah, there's not, uh, it's more active, right? And so sitting and doing a typical IT job wasn't something that interested me. So it was more, you know, as a as a former officer now, it was kind of, you get pigeonholed into, well, you're going to work for maybe a, a ma- major manufacturing firm and start out as a production supervisor and just kind of, it's a similar organizational structure, kind of change chain of command stuff that just feels familiar. So that's the kind of stuff I was applying for. But uh, yeah, I couldn't, couldn't find much in Cleveland, so I opened myself up to Chicago and immediately got a job. Interesting. Yeah. Where? It was a small company called Gold Eagle, and they, right, they bottled aftermarket automotive fluids. Interesting. You ever put, does uh, Willie ever put stable in his stuff over the winter, the, like gas stabilizer? Like diesel treat? Yeah. Yeah. That's bottled by Gold Eagle. Interesting. <laughs> right. Random. Very. Okay. Yeah, so I was a production supervisor there. And it, uh, yeah, I, I, something, was, something was missing, right? It wasn't quite ready to settle into that role. And one of my buddies from the Air Force got out about the same time I did. And he was down in Texas. And he was doing a kind of a similar style job. But his grandparents had a small farm and ranch store. And he called me up one night and was like, hey, my grandparents want to sell their farm and ranch store. We should buy it. <laughs> where Where is it in Texas? Thorndale, Texas. Which about is? 45 minutes east, northeast of Austin. Okay. Had you town ever? Of, at, town of 670 people, I think. Of course. <laughs> had you ever been like, hey, I think I want to be in no, not at all. That wasn't, <laughs> that definitely wasn't something that I'd ever thought about, but it just, it was an interesting proposal. So I said, yes, naturally. And so after just about nine months in Chicago, packed up, headed to Texas. And bought a 
farm and ranch ranch store. store. And what did, at the time of sale, what were they like carrying? So, so mostly cattle feed, right? So my, it was in Milam County and my understanding, at least at the time, Milam County had more cows than per people. capita. Well, then, like, I think the, the density was such that it was ranked pretty high in the U.S. Wow. Yeah. So we lived on his other grandfather's cattle ranch, 300 acres. I think they had they were running 100 head of cattle. So it was pretty little by Texas standards. But... Yeah, that was pretty big for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. And, yeah, so we did that. Let's see. Yeah, mostly cattle feed, you know, chicken feed, just animal feed. Products, yeah, it was a feed mostly. store. Yeah. Okay. And from there, <laughs> hell yeah, we got into, uh, we got sold on butcher shop franchises. Okay. What, what, fr- I didn't realize that butcher shops had franchise. Like, yeah. I, what butcher shop? This isn't a happy story for me. That's okay. <laughs> it's a, it was a little outfit, started on the East Coast. I think one of his buddies put us onto it because there was a, so there was a small, uh, meat market butcher shop in town right next to the feed store and his grandparents made a pretty locally famous sausage and we had talked about well maybe we should buy the buy the meat market and make it bigger you know just kind of add on to what we were doing in Thordale but yeah we got turned on to this kind of higher end butcher shop idea that was based out of New Hampshire okay are you familiar with the uh, Fairway Meat Market? Have you been to the one in Ames? Yeah. Very similar to that. Similar concept. Yeah. Okay. And they were really good salesmen. They had 11 corporate stores, and they were just starting to franchising across the U.S., and so we bought a territory in Austin and opened up a franchise, and it was, it was pretty good until it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so then with this, did you, were you guys like the butchers then? Were you doing? Yeah, I would. Like, how does that? I, if I say if I say I was a butcher, somebody will comment like, "Well, technically, you know, you weren't starting with a whole cow." So, no, we were we were uh, you were taking trained a- meat cutters, okay. right? So, yeah, it was uh, we, it was a lot of prime cuts, and, and so they had a proprietary process for like vacuum marinating beef tips, which was kind of a that was like the signature item for the this meat house. chain. Yeah. So then. I have so many. I have so many questions. <laughs> have we not talked about this? No, before? we have like very briefly touched on it. Like I knew that you had yeah. had a butcher shop in Austin, but like I didn't know the context around it. Didn't know it was a franchise. Interesting in and of itself. Yeah. Didn't know how you got to Texas in the first place, which is fascinating. Um, you just must have been at that stage in your life where you're just like, yeah, forget. Or you, well, you it, hated Chicago that much, perhaps. No, not necessarily. It was just. It wasn't what I, it just wasn't hitting it for me. Yeah. And, you know, that's not something that has really changed either. If an interesting opportunity pops up in front of me, I'm going to chase it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a a good quality to have. So Um, we did, yeah, we did end up opening two locations of those. And we did end up taking um, over the butcher shop in town and expanding that. And did you rebrand it under? No, no, that one was completely independent. Yeah, we were able to keep that one separate. Okay. And so when... Like when you get, were you getting like half cows and quarter cows in, or like was it already? No, so it was just like going to the fairway meat market, right? So we were we were trained meat cutters, quote unquote. Right? Yeah, and we won't, we won't. There, I think uh, I There's think some... there is some specific training to be an actual butcher, right? <laughs> A little bit. But yeah, so just you know, cut cutting loins, you know. Okay, so it was not. It wasn't we had as some if specialty were... grinding. We did, you know, we had boar's head meat sandwiches and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But it wasn't, we would cater. Wasn't as if you were breaking down half a cow. Correct. Like you weren't getting no, in, not at all. you know. Okay, that's a bummer. I think yeah. my favorite story is we did cater a birthday party for Tito's daughter. Okay. Like the Tito who makes Tito's vodka. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We didn't even realize it was him until his wife came out and tipped us with a couple of bottles of Tito's vodka. And she was telling us how much he really enjoyed making it at the time. Because this would have been 2010. Okay. Which was funny. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, cash tip would have been nice too, hopefully. No, the vodka was good. <laughs> <laughs> vodka was good. A 
Okay, so you have these two locations. They're both locations in Austin? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, what made you go from one to two? Well, it was, uh, the timing was, looked right. There, the, you know, the real estate was open in the area we wanted to be in. And, you know, typical investor uh, pressure to keep expanding. Interesting. Yeah. But, you know, we're young, make mistakes, yeah. didn't quite go the way we wanted it to. So that the whole franchise is shuttered at this point. I was going to say, I yeah. don't. And I, um, I'm pretty sure, I haven't talked to him in a couple years, I'm pretty sure my old business partner still has the feed store and the butcher shop in Thorndale. Thorndale. Yeah. Next time I'm down there. I have to scoop over to Thorndale and be like, hey, <laughs> funny story. <Yeah. laughs> okay. So when when did those stores shut so we When did you shut those down? Uh, that would have been 20, end of 2012, 2013. But it was starting to, it was starting to wind down in 2012. So he was taking over the operations and I needed to find something else to move into. So as a as a veteran, there are companies that offer kind of hiring services, and so they put on a like a job fair basically at a hotel in Dallas, and so I drove up there, and based on what you say your interests are and what your resume reads like, they will set you up with say three to five interviews with different companies, and one of my interviews was with a former Marine recruiter for John Deere. And we hit it off right away. And so, I, yeah, I ended up moving up to Iowa to take a job at the John Deere plant in Ankeny. Yeah. In, yeah, 2012. That's wild. And, it, yeah, I definitely thought it was going to be another two to three year stint somewhere and then on to the next thing. And that was 12 and a half years ago. Yeah. Naturally. Here we are. <laughs> Here we are. Um, at what point does Andrea enter the picture <laughs> well, 2007. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We started dating then and we moved to Chicago together mm -hmm. and she decided to stay in Chicago when I moved to Texas. And then when I got back up to the Midwest, I was able to convince her to move out to Iowa. Yeah. You were <laughs> but yeah, she was in Chicago for eight years. Okay. With the same people that she's with now or she yeah, was? Yeah. Okay. She's still at the same company. Oh, okay. Nice. Um, all right. So you convinced her to get to Iowa. Yeah. So she's been working from home, uh, like she likes to say organically since 2015. Yeah. She was yeah. a trendsetter before it was right. cool. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So you move up to Iowa to Ankeny at this point with John Deere, you are a production supervisor, which means you're just doing what? Supervising welders. We'll call it supervising and not babysitting. Yeah. <laughs> It's like running a big daycare. Yes. A lot of personalities. Right. Yeah. And making it not unlike what you were doing in the Air Force in many ways. Uh, not at all true. Really? I'll say one, one of the interesting or one of the nice things is having lawful authority versus trying to manage somebody who's on a contract. Okay. Big difference. That was a big culture shock. Okay. Talk to me about that a little bit. What do you mean? Hey, can you do this for me? Uh, it's not my job description. Is what <laughs> you ran kinda, into yeah, at John Deere. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, but the nice thing about being a deer is they, they did offer the opportunity to move around to a, a couple of different jobs, which really suited my, I want to do this for a couple of years and then try something else. So I was able to be, I was a manufacturing engineer for the cotton picking units. And then I was a computer, or not computer, the continuing continuous improvement coordinator for the factory, which was really neat because you got to, I had a, te I had a team of, 10 or 11 and we'd go around and every department had kind of an idea board and you would take the what seemed to be the best ideas and run it by the engineers and see if you could improve the processes for the guys actually doing the jobs and the ideas came from them so it was a pretty it was a pretty good program so i had a lot of fun doing that one kind of a strategize strategize implement mm -hmm. and measure whether it did anything or not yeah. so then you got to touch a lot of different departments and yeah. not just be which stuck was, in one yeah which was neat Did they I make enjoyed that one the cotton pickers in yeah in Ankeny yeah interesting it's um, the third largest John Deere factory which people don't people don't realize they're like wait John Deere in Ankeny yeah that's yeah, a big factory well yeah I mean sprayers cotton pickers and tillage yeah interesting what a combo 
the cotton picker one is the, but then I I'm, think, yeah, I think people underestimate how big that campus is too. That's well, 455 acres. Yeah. I, I was going to say until you drive out there and then you see it and it, it is very large. Mm-hmm. Um, granted, I think it used to be more standalone and now it feels like Ankeny is like really. Well, yeah. Deeper. And I, I don't go, I don't get down to Ankeny very often, but I was down there a couple of weeks ago and I, <laughs> I had to use the GPS to get around. There are so many new streets. I know. It's unrecognizable. Right. It's wild how big it's gotten. And that's what I mean is like it, John Deere campus used to kind of be its own little outpost thing right. there. But now it's just freaking suburbia. Yeah. It's in, the, yeah, it. it's in the middle of it all. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. Um, did they relocate some of those like with that most recent layoff? Do you know? I don't Did know. you see that stuff? I, well, yeah, I, I still keep in touch with a, a few guys there, and they were telling me about it. I do need to check in with them and yeah. see if they're still employed. Well, I, I think a lot of it was Dubuque, is what I understand, but I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. I, um, I don't pay too, I don't pay too close attention. I just to know it. that that just that all just got announced that they're relocating a bunch of stuff to Mexico, and so a whole bunch of people got laid off. So I was just curious. So. Well, it 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 comes and goes. Yeah, we've reclo- relocated stuff there, and we've brought stuff from there back and it just kind of kind of happens just just the way of the business yeah Yeah. they say finding market size or market i don't remember what the actual pc term is for it but it's something like that right sizing right sizing that's it yes right sizing for current market is what they would say officially so whatever okay so you are at john deere how how many years did you Spend at John Deere. Uh, how long was I there? In 2012, then 18, six and a half years. Okay. Yeah. 12 to 18. Yeah. At what point did you get into the whole, like, let's go lift heavy things? Yeah. It's a 20, <laughs> let's see. I've always, I've always been in shape, right? I've always, there hasn't been a time where I haven't been in or around a gym. Yeah. And it, it was, so I was doing the anytime fitness thing for a while. Cause when I was with John Deere, I traveled a bit. So it was nice, right? It, it definitely serves a purpose. Um, and then 20, see when I moved to Ames in 2014, uh, that was my first experience with a, like a CrossFit style gym. Mm-hmm. I don't think they, I don't know if they were technically CrossFit. I forget. But anyway, so I started, I started that the CrossFit style workouts weren't generally my thing. But it did introduce me to lifting heavy mm-hmm. and really, really concentrating on form for the first time. Yeah. So about the time I was 37, I started getting into the powerlifting pretty heavily, <laughs> pun intended, I suppose. Uh, and then somewhere around 2016, uh, I left the gym I was at. And threw some equipment in a garage, right? And people just started showing up. Hey, can we work out with you? Sure. And then a a coach came over who ended up being a future business partner, and he started coaching. And I, you know, after a couple months, we kind of looked at each other like, I think we have a gym. <laughs> it just kind of happened accidentally. Had zero intention of it going this way, but it was fun. So I. Uh, I took a class through USA powerlifting, drove back to Ohio for it. Funny enough. Yeah. I got my coaching, my first coaching certification and started coaching people. And really around that time was when I realized you can have positive relationships with people again, right? It didn't, it was, uh, it, it kind of gave you that feeling of camaraderie again right the, sh- the shared misery and yeah yeah and like really helping people out and you know when somebody comes to the gym whether or not they're having a great day or a terrible day they want to make their day better right and so you get to be a part of that mm-hmm. and, I was, and I was fortunate enough to realize that and it really kind of changed my outlook and what do I want out of life yeah and so that one it got big enough that we moved it to Ames and then a year later, moved it to a bigger location in Ames. And around 2018, I was pretty fed up with doing the, you know, the large-scale manufacturing job and uh, decided to do the gym full-time. So I went back to school. So, I had, so I'd gotten my MBA, 
at John Deere. They were nice enough to pay for it. Oh, that's, nice. a, that's a good perk. That's yeah. a nice benefit. And I, yeah, so I had some GI Bill left. So I used my GI Bill to get a kinesiology degree at Iowa State. Uh, it was some, you know, something to kind of occupy myself and really kind of led lend some credibility to being a, a now gym owner, like a legit gym owner. You mean your one class at USA? At USA Power. Well, having a certification certainly <laughs> hel- certainly <laughs> helps, but yeah, <laughs> being able to understand, you know, and or explain energy systems and mm-hmm. muscle groups and why a compound exercise is good for you, in you know, you have you have a goal and you know, here's what you can do to reach that goal. Being able to explain that stuff was, uh, I thought what felt important to me. Yeah, yeah. So about uh, so we were there for a couple years. And, yeah, 2020, I was still really big into powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting. And the gym got big enough where, the, you know, there were people that were doing CrossFit-style workouts and people that were doing powerlifting Olympic workouts. And just kind of – we went our separate ways. He he kept the, the CrossFit-style people. And I took all lifters, came out to Nevada. And, yeah, three locations in Nevada. So the first location didn't work out quite <laughs> quite too well. We were, I think – the Masons were nice enough to let <laughs> to lease us a space in their building. And th- so the building's got a basement. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we looked at it and we brought them down there and talked through what we wanted to do. And, it, you know, it was constructed really, really well. We figured, you yeah, know, this will be fine. So if you're not familiar with Olympic weightlifting, right, two movements, <laughs> both the barbell goes overhead and, and then, then once it's overhead, gets dropped. <laughs> if you... <laughs> Have you, have, you ever, have you ever dropped a bar in a room that has a basement? Holy cow. Yeah, we so we got it all built out, and the first day somebody dropped a snatch from overhead, shook the building. <laughs> and the business owner next door came running over. What happened? Is everybody okay? We're like, oh, no. This is not, this is not going to work out. <laughs> yeah, so after six weeks, <laughs> they asked us to leave. But luckily, there was a spot open up the street, so we just moved literally up the street three or four blocks and yeah, went in there and it was a, we had a good time. It was a really, it was a good feeling. It was kind of a, had a bro gym feel, but a little bit bigger. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice. It I really enjoyed that spot. Well, and, um, prior to getting the back room, it was yeah. very intimate. It was. <laughs> shall, shall we say that second space was very intimate. Um, but it was good. Like, you know, it wasn't like you had a huge number of members at that point. Yeah, it was so, perfect for the 25, 30 members we had. And right. And everybody, those... but, and everybody had their spot and everybody, <laughs> yeah, everybody was coming, came in at their point at their time. Yeah, it, it worked out really well. Yeah. And then adding the backspace was great. And then, you know, I do forget that we didn't have that space for no, about a year. I was going to say for yeah. quite a good time, it was not there. And then, um, went on tracks, like moved all of their, cause that was, was that what the stuff was in the back? No, there was, no, a, they were next door. Yeah. The guy that runs the server for that building okay. had that room, but yeah, you know, they got, you know, eventually you get your server equipment down to one little box and so they didn't need it anymore. Right. Um, I just remember them moving stuff out for freaking. Oh, they had it packed. They had so much stuff in there. It yeah. was insane. Um, but so then you took that space and then it at least felt a little more spacious for about, gosh, I'm trying to think it was maybe six months, maybe a year until, um, the arena suddenly closed. Yeah. Uh, well, and see, then all of a sudden it got August, crowded again. It was August of last year, right? August was, 23. Yeah. August of 23. Yeah, so we would have been in that space two and a half years total. Yeah, yeah but I'm saying the opened up back didn't come until... Well, we were there for a year and a half. That came open a year after we were there. Okay. So we had it, so yeah, we had had it about a year six, and a half. About yeah. six months where it felt uh, spacious, yeah. shall we say. And then, um, then the arena shuts down unexpectedly. Yeah, that, that was... Uh, that was funny. We were sitting in there with our, our little five five thirty AM group all just kinda of chatting, rolling out and <laughs> this train of cars comes down the street and this big group of people comes in. Hey, we need a place to work out. <laughs> okay. Come we'll make in. it work. Yeah. 
Yeah, but uh, it was a it was a welcome addition. What a great group of people. Yeah. Yeah, and they you know they were willing to make the commitment to me, so I made the commitment to them, and we moved again. Yes. But this time it was only half a block. Right. It was a little easier. For yeah, definitely fortuitous timing that building being open. For sure. Okay, so then you move. Gosh, when was that? September. Seems like. Yeah, we moved in September, and I think official opening date was October first. Right. I was gonna say it seems like it was. It was pretty quick after they, after Arena closed, that spot came up and you were like, oh, we're moving. Yeah. <laughs> um, all while you start another new job. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot about that part. <laughs> yeah. So I, once, it, well, once we moved into the second Nevada location, everything kind of settled. Yeah. Settled. And it was, the gym was good. It was running itself and. I had over the over the course of those few years that since we started I'd become a very sociable person and used to being around people and then I got I started you know people coming in the morning and then I'd sit there during the day and it was man I think I'm lonely. <laughs> <laughs> I need something to do. But then you all you know, as a you have to come to a business decision too at that point it was do I want to make the gym a job? Whereas up to that point had been, you know, because I was going in school full time and doing the gym and I was maintaining some rental properties and just really, you know, just staying busy. I like to move, stick to stay busy. And all of a sudden I wasn't. And yeah, so I came to that point where do I want to chase, chase the dollar in the gym, like just be out there and hustling and building classes and getting clients and doing personal training. And just, I didn't want to make what was my kind of my safe space a job yeah you didn't want to monetize your hobby really right and I think I talked about that at one million cups uh yeah you might have yeah. you might have so that that was kind of the decision point and at the time uh one of my good buddies who's still a member was a superintendent at Ballard Schools and he was like you know you'd make a really good teacher like you should you should go talk to the principal and you know and maybe explore that a little bit. And I, so I started thinking about it and it's definitely a career path I had never considered. Uh, my mom was a kindergarten teacher for you know, 30, 35 years. Kindergarten. Kindergarten. Wow. Loved it. Yeah. She loves being a grandparent. That's awesome. Absolutely loves it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so it was a, it was an interesting thing to think about. So I went in and talked to the principal and yeah, they were, they needed to build a business program because they hadn't had one before and business, and computer science are two of the strands that are going to that are required now by the state. And so they, you know, they needed someone to come in that had the the background in that could build a program. And so to get me in the door for the first year, I started as a para educator in the special education classroom, which was very eye opening. Right, that's a segment of the population I had never really been exposed to before. It was challenging for mm -hmm. sure, but I'm really glad I did it. Yeah. Yeah. Get you, you know, got you in the door every day, really got you, you know, really tested to see how you could respond to people that have needs that are different than your own. Right. right. And how can you adjust to their education needs? So it was good. It was a really good experience. So then I, you know, after that, I had the experience and interviewed well for the position and yeah now I'm the business and computer science teacher at Ballard High School which you officially started that this so I just finished up my first year doing it. yeah so it would yeah. have been fall of 23 mm -hmm. when you first started teaching and essentially you were um building the curriculum from ground up because like you said it did not exist yeah and the nice thing about the teaching community is everybody is willing to help Right. So I got I got to shout out Vicki Hales at Gilbert High School for really hooking me up with curriculum and letting me come into her classroom and, and observe how she teaches her classes. And yeah, that was a That was a big help. But it's a it's a good group of teachers in that um, that, that CTE, which is that career and technical education community, really helping each other out. And you're only teaching high school. Correct. Is that right? OK, yeah. so you're not doing like eighth grade exploratory or mm -hmm. anything like that. Um, and is it? freshman through senior or is it just okay freshman through yeah, senior nine through 12 yeah all an, mixed up an elective mm -hmm. okay um 
And was it w- how many separate like classes? Like how many separate curriculums? Seven different Holy classes. Holy moly yeah yeah that was a lot of the reaction that i got from, <laughs> from oh other teachers God. but i'll tell you uh, again it's something that fits me i wouldn't want to teach the same class four times a day yeah right? and i get to i get to teach six different classes which is nice and are they semester long classes or are they the full year i have it depends so i have like a computer science principles class mm-hmm. that is a year long but everything else is semesters okay can yeah. you name them i can so i have oh, next year Right, so I have intro to business, I have business two, which will introduce soft skills, right? Like being able to have a conversation with somebody, writing an email, developing a resume, interview skills. We'll get into some project based learning where we'll use the Iowa Clearinghouse to pick up projects for businesses and also be propositioning our local business owners for any projects that they have that could be done inside the classroom. Okay. That'll that'll be a fun class. That'll be new for next year. What is the Iowa Clearinghouse? So that's a web portal run right. by the state, and businesses around the state can sign up for it, and they can put they can list projects on there, and so CTE teachers can use that and sign up for projects and grab a project and have their students do like a social media project for a business or help them like calibrate instruments or whatever a small project could be for a local business that wants to get high school or some experience in real world projects but doesn't necessarily take them out of the classroom okay so it's it's things that can be done in classroom right. but are hands-on and purposeful shall we say it's right like... and it just gives them exposure to real world projects what's it what's it going to be like and do you know, can any, like any Iowa business sign up for that? Yes. Or, oh, yeah. cool. Free of charge? Do I would you know? assume so. That's interesting. It's got to be free. Yeah. That's interesting. I didn't know that existed. Yeah, because these, these aren't, these aren't internships. They're not paid positions. It's just, here's a, here's a project that we think your classroom could complete. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I didn't know that existed. So that'll be, a, that'll be a fun class. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I derailed <laughs> That's you. That's all right. So then we have the computer science principles, which mm-hmm. will be a, a year long. We have web design and computer programming. So I use an online classroom for that. They can pick pretty much any programming language that they want, and it's more self-directed. Like the whole curriculum is in there, which makes it really easy. Mm-hmm. All the lessons are in there. They can follow them along. They, they learn to code. They do basic coding projects. Sure. And let's see, accounting one, accounting two. Interesting. So we do multi-column journal yeah. accounting, right? Credit, they're, they're not going to be Credits and debits, a, credits and debits. Oh my gosh. There's a song. But it, you know, and then <laughs> it's funny because it, it does help in real life. Because it does. I, I do, I do bookkeeping mm-hmm. for a couple of small companies on the side mm-hmm. and really uh, like really getting into the accounting side of it does make you a better bookkeeper. Yes. Yeah. So the accounting classes are interesting. There's all, there's always a bunch of kids that want to take the first one. But <laughs> not so many that want to take the second one. <laughs> yes. I, it's required as a for a business degree in college. Like, you have to take accounting one. And I think same. I think unless you're an accounting major, yeah. nobody signs up. And I, I only ever had to take uh, a managerial accounting when I did my no. MBA, which is different. Yeah. No, we High had, level stuff. We had to take, and I finance, I think I had to end up taking more than that. And then I... Um, I had to take tax accounting or tax law or something like that. Oh, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, just <laughs> <laughs> it, it is good. Like you said, from a bookkeeping standpoint, like under understanding what accounts are related to what and how every, all of that interacts. It's good. Yeah. But that's and it's, good. yeah, you know, they, they're not going to leave high school and become CPAs, but it gives them some exposure because they, at least if they wanted to take some accounting classes in college. Yeah. Right? It's more of a college. I would call it a college prep class. Right. It just gives you some, a background. Yeah. So you're not. Completely... And then we have the digital media technology. Okay. Got a few sections of that. I'm going to run them all together next year, but they learn basic video editing. We're going to have, and you know, they can make sitcoms, they can make movies, they can make movie trailers. It's really just kind of getting behind the camera, getting in front of it, writing a script, you know, understanding what different shots are. That, that's that's pretty fun. They just get to be creative. Yeah. And then the, the next step in that class, and we'll start this next year, is we'll have a podcast. Yeah. 
I'll come consult. This, this is good practice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we'll have a podcast unit, and then we'll have kind of a morning show, morning news show segment. Interesting. A little video production. So you really are, it's kind of all over the place. All you over the place. You have a whole bunch of different things to keep you interested, at least for a couple of years. Yeah, and then the, the last thing we're working towards for next year is offering work-based learning. Okay. Hopefully we can get this to go through. But this is actual internships outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the students, I think this will be a two, it's like a two credit class. So it'll be two periods, but they actually go out and they get an actual internship with a company in the community and go out and observe them and check in on them. But yeah, they get to have some work experience while they're in high school. Yeah. I can think of a couple different places within your district that would probably be good fits for things like that, that are like small businesses that would probably be open to yeah, that you know the nice thing about being in, in Huxley is a lot of the business owners have their kids yeah. in the school system, so they're very supportive. Yeah. It's a good community. I say even like Slater, I think mm-hmm. like Public House would probably do it. I think um, Gross Wen Technologies might do it. They'd be both very different experiences, but they'd be cool. So that's neat. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to that one. I, and I hope we get that one going. Yeah, um, that would be yeah, that would be a neat class neat opportunity to be able to go get credit for having real world experience okay so you start teaching two months into that you're moving gym gym locations (laughs) oh my gosh (laughs) yeah school started at the end of august and then mid-september we start moving but yeah you know that's the way these things work out (laughs) the move was pretty good right we had we had we had that entire building cleared out that first night right but it also helps being kind of you know, in a, in a small community near the country, because then people show up with skid <laughs> forklifts, steers and, yeah, forklifts yeah, and forklifts, skid steers, skid and, steers. And, yeah, you get a group of people just going back and forth. It it was pretty good. Yeah, made pretty pretty short work of it. Even yeah. and it was nice that it was only like half a block. Like yeah. that was also. But we did get the our entire gym moved in three days. Yeah, it was wild. And set up, moved, set up, and operational. In three it was days. wild. Okay, so now that you've been in that gym for a little over six months at this mm-hmm. point, almost seven months, um, how has it kind of evolved? How many members th- would you say you had pre the arena? About 30, 35. Okay, kind of and now around in there. you'd probably say you're at? Around 85. Okay. Yeah. So more than doubled. Yeah. And so how has, how has it really kind of evolved? You know, there's, there are certainly more members, and it's a bigger space, but it still feels like the same small community, mm-hmm. right? Because you don't, it wasn't a bunch of strangers that showed up, right? Everybody was kind of familiar with everybody anyway. Right. And yeah, we all just, we all just work out in the same room now instead of two different buildings, right? We have half the gym is set up for functional fitness, and the other half is set up for straight lifting, and so there's something for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and everybody, and and then you get to see people doing different styles of working out or, you know, different fitness philosophies and so every, and people just kind of dabble like, Oh, well, I want to try a powerlifting block or I want to try an Olympic weightlifting block or yeah, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to spend the summer doing functional fitness and try to trim up kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But it's fun and you get to expose more people to competitions. So, you know, we've been able to go to a couple different Olympic weightlifting competitions and, uh, we've got some pretty talented power lifters that have done well at regionals and we'll take a small team to nationals in October. So it's been, yeah, that kind of stuff has been fun because the, the teams get bigger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so now that you have the bigger space, are you thinking about, um, doing some, co- maybe like hosting some competitions? I just had a conversation with somebody about that the feeling. other day. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a smaller powerlifting federation i want to say the guy that runs it is down in arkansas but it kind of they kind of cover that central region but i've got uh i've got a member that that lifts in there and then the is guy it, that owns that federation is interested in hosting something at the is gym it w, so that wr it's not, it's not wrpf not one. it's uh don't say yeah it. I, I don't know it's That's not fine. it's not upa or yeah. apa or something like that but oh upa it's it's not upa but it's oh. some it's some something similar to that okay but it's a it's a monolift gotcha uh, powerlifting federation so you're gonna have to get a monolift yeah so what we'll, what we'll try to do is I, I think the deal that 
that has been like very, very briefly talked about is get a deal on a monolith. He'll, he'll bring it up mm-hmm. and in payment for not having to bring it back, we'll you know, get a good deal on one. But yeah, so we'll see how that works out. Maybe the end of the year, or early next year. But yeah, well, I just think we'll definitely go on that direction. You're set up for it now in yeah. the space. You know, it's more of a more of an option. Not that like you couldn't do it in the old space like you could. Well, I mean, we did do the just for fun deadlift stuff in the back space, but, yes, but it, it does get crowded. Yeah, for sure. I was going to say it's just it was none of the rooms were wide enough. Right. You know, necessarily was was the problem. Yeah. But to run a fully federated meet just takes a lot more room because you've got warm up. Yeah, there's, area, there's yeah, yeah, yeah. You need the warm up area. You need a place for people to spectate, change you know, spectators, judges, technical table. Yes. You know, a little bit more technology. Yeah, it takes it takes a lot. It's a small army of people. It is well, loaders and people to move equipment around. That's one thing that I feel like people just it's a production don't appreciate about yeah. putting on events. They like love to come and participate <laughs> in them, <laughs> but they don't understand that like it's more work than it's you. a lot of work. It is, yeah. um, and it's a lot of work on the back end to make it feel smooth on the front end. Mm-hmm. And uh, I always take it as a compliment when people are like, "Oh, that." I feel like you have a lot of fun doing this. I'm like, oh, you don't see the rest. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you, know, you know, it's a lot of work just doing a just for fun deadlift meet. But, yes. Yeah. A thousand percent. Your trophies aren't big enough. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, they look bigger on the web page. <laughs> the things, the things like that. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know, the, George had ordered these little trophies for the uh, Lincoln Highway Days. Um, deadlift competition, and they were a little, a little short. <laughs> they were, what, they, were a little, they were maybe six inches, inches tall. Um, six inches. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so somebody had made the comment that they wanted bigger trophies. This is it. <laughs> yeah, it <Yeah>. is. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it happens. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So and but then it is funny, you know, all those little costs <sighs> that you need, especially when they, you're doing it as a fundraiser. Trophies are insanely expensive yes insanely well and that's the thing like i said people just don't necessarily if they've never run one um or even if they go into their first year thinking like they're gonna make all of this money Mm-mm. like it's just not it's not realistic it's not gonna happen um yeah so thanks again to all everybody that sponsors the, the lincoln highway days deadlift competition yes. because it is it would not happen without them and we are so that is, it's, we're doing it again this summer, Lincoln Highway Days, so Saturday. Fourth it, week of August. Yeah, it's the Saturday after the State Fair. Right. Fourth Saturday in August at the, yeah, the Story County Fairgrounds. Mm-hmm. And we do this as a scholarship fundraiser. Yeah. So we, we made it a traveling scholarship last year to try to get some more participation from the, from the high school teams. Since high school is now near and dear to my heart, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, so we had a we had a couple kids from Ankeny come and just kill it studs. last year. Studs. Yeah, studs, wild, like studs. I was impressed. Tate, four, I think it was fourteen at the time, weighed in and maybe one hundred and forty eight pounds, something like that. Pulled six oh five. Yeah, it was insane. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Insane. Yeah, so the the scholarship this year went to Ankeny High School. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was fun. And are you planning on making that a traveling scholarship again yeah. this year? So same deal. Same deal. So if you have high schoolers that like to lift heavy things, come participate. Yeah. There's and the chance. high school participants themselves will win awards. The yeah. best male and female lifters. Which and then cool. we do and then a smaller cash award for the open divisions. Right. Yeah. And that's it's any age, any ability. We've had I think our youngest lifter was eight in our oldest from the legion yeah he was 70 something something yeah yeah all ages yeah he just rocked up and was ready to lift (laughs) he was so excited (laughs) he was so excited yeah that was good yeah so um and people can register for that you haven't opened registration for that i have not yet we will in the next couple weeks i was gonna say that'll that'll be on your facebook i'll be handing out flyers at 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 your your good that's a good way to do it (laughs) you'll have a captive audience yeah uh, a captive supportive audience of people that are already into it um yeah we have our collins fourth annual collins days deadlift competition is two weeks away two weeks and two days away yeah so uh george is our 
as our judge because he's a much better judge than Willie ever. Okay. I am pretty judgmental. So. You <laughs> just comes naturally. <laughs> um, and we will, this year we will have a loading chart and all of that kind of stuff so that that makes it easier. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those things you just, you learn it as you go and you figure out what works and what doesn't. All the little things to make it smoother. All the little things. And then, you know, pour some freaking gasoline on the fire last year for us going from 14 to 57. That was, was a big swing. <sighs> We were not prepared <laughs> entirely. Yeah, but overall, it went pretty well. It did. It, it did. did. All things considered, like, it went fine. Um, but, man, I just, that was stressful. Are you doing two platforms this year? I think we're going to have to. Um, I just think, I mean, last year we got through 57 in three hours. Like, yeah. it was not, you know, it wasn't super long. Um, but I just think two platforms is the way to go. And like I said, with... We have 57 pre-registered already. We're capping it at 100. But, like, let's say we fill up, you know, with lockups to that 100. We'll want the two platforms. Like, it just makes a difference. Yeah. So, I don't know. We'll see what happens. I got two weeks to figure it out. So, bring your umbrellas. It'll probably be pretty Oh, hot. my God. I, every Literally every single year. All four years yeah. it has rained. And, and it's, you know, the last previous three years has been a drought. But that day, it decides to rain every single year. Fingers and toes crossed that this year maybe we got all of yeah. our... Yeah, the weather's been pretty wild. I know. So that's where I'm saying. Like, maybe it got it out of its system. And by Collins' days, we're like, no, nah, we're going to make this one a dry one. Just this one today. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting. I'm excited for year four of that. Um, thank it'll you. be good. If you aren't familiar with the the summer deadlift series, which is ba- which is what I've been calling it the past few years, there are a number of them around the state. Yeah. And if you ever, yeah, if you want to just go and deadlift without any pressure. Yeah, there's no pressure. No. It's just for fun. Everybody cheering you on. Yeah. There's let's see. There's Collins. So there was Conrad. Um. Yeah. So there Bondurant started one this past weekend Brickhouse are they doing it so it's like yeah it's Brickhouse one of the ladies who came and lifted last year do you remember the young little kid the youngest kid we had last year lifting no no but anyway so his coach I think she's the one who did the one in in Bondurant I can't think of her name off the top of my head but so she Brickhouse they Tracy Maybe. I think so. Yeah. I should know like her name because I've met her a number of times. I'm sorry if I got that wrong. Yeah, she's like in her 50s. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think she did that one. I don't newly, know what... She's a newly minted USA powerlifting referee. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Okay, so she did one. Conrad's coming up this weekend. Um, the weekend after that, I don't know of one. Then you have ours, and then you have State Fair. State Fair. Um, and then after a State Fair is yours. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's... Uh, the most expensive is State Fair. State Fair, by for far. sure. Um, and that was, so. I, but I they s- give really big trophies. They do so. give really big trophies. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's that. Um, but so originally, so Willie originally started the deadlift competition flipping summer series thing yeah. back when he was teaching at Baxter as a fundraiser for the weight room to buy new equipment in the okay. weight room. And so the very first year that he did it, um, Eric from Conrad mm-hmm. lifted the guys from muscle bound, brought like 25 people. He did no advertising. Like this was total just yeah luck fluke that people showed up. So he had it at the time he had his gooseneck trailer. So they lifted on the trailer. Yeah, I was there. I did it. Were you? Oh yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay, so that was the very first one. So then Eric <laughs> then reached out to Willie and was like, hey, can I have like your registration form and all that stuff? So that was like the original paper registration form yeah. for the Conrad one. Willie did it for another year and like nobody showed up, but he was done teaching, so he didn't care at that point. Um, and then so that one died. And then because he always, with Collins Day's one, he was like, I want somebody to be able to, I want it to be like state fair competition but not as expensive right. and not like as high production i guess a little yeah well i mean they have a literally a big stage yes. and a big crowd but it is a production i mean it's it's the state fair so. and it's fought like that was my very first powerlifting okay. experience in 2018 willie and i had just started dating like that spring and he's like oh you should go do this um and i did and i got second and i got a big trophy and he didn't <laughs> And then we, I'm surprised you guys got married. <laughs> and then we walked around the state fair 
uh, with me holding the trophy. And everybody's like, where's your trophy? And he's like, let me <laughs> like hear that. And then we did it again the next year. And he again did not get a trophy. And I got third and got another trophy. <laughs> um, but so then when we started up, that was, you know, that was kind of the idea was yeah. let's be an option for somebody who is not necessarily ready for the state fair. But like maybe after they do it, they're like, oh, this was a good experience. Yeah. Maybe I can do another one. Um, but like you said, I think it's just such a low pressure and it's fun. It it's, is. It's more fun than like a full power lifting meet. Way more fun. Cause it's just, like I said, it's much. Yeah. Easier. And it's, and it's, you know, it draws in a bunch of local people. And so it's, you know, everybody knows everybody who's lifting and yeah, you know, that, that's the, it's the same idea with the Lincoln highway days. We've got the dual and pavilion. So it does tend to be the coolest spot in the fairgrounds. Yeah. Cause it's shaded, it's shaded and, and there's a nice breeze. Yeah. There's a big donkey fan in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, and you guys yeah. have the seating and everything like it is. It's a good spot. Yeah. For it's it. fun. I'm always mildly concerned you're going to crack the concrete, but I'll be fine. With it. Yeah. It'll be fine. You know, yep. I, I have actual deadlift platforms now we could bring over. Yeah. Well, for, yeah, mm-hmm. I was going to say for ours, we just build it out of plywood and it works. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Anyways, so what are you, um, what are you most excited about in the next 12 months? Well, I'm heading to Italy for a couple of weeks in a July. Which time out? You speak Italian. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a stretch. <laughs> Parlo solo un po' d'Italiano, okay? okay? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> Enough to be dangerous. Enough to get around. Yeah, we've yeah we have some family over there. So one of my favorite stories, and I'm not going to tell the whole story because it's long, but about being in Germany. My grandpa, his mom is from a small town in Italy, and when he came through Italy on the first wave in World War II, and they passed by the town, and so he went up into town and you know traded sugar for flour and stuff, and took some pictures with his family and. He had a, you know, got to just revisit and see where his mom was from, you know, where his roots were. And so when I was in Germany, he sent me some pictures from when he was over there. So, you know, if you ever get some time, you should drive down there and see if any of the family is still there. Because they had lost touch over the years. And so I did. And making, again, a long story short, I did. I found him. Nice. And I, I called my grandpa up from his little cousin's apartment. Because when I met his little cousin and I told him my name, George LaCava, and he just looked at me. He goes, Frank LaCava, the Jeep, the Jeep. He remembered my grandpa giving him a ride in the Army Jeep. Oh. Yeah. So we've, yeah, so we stayed in touch. We go back uh, every other year or so. So I'm going to go over there with my with my brother. He's, again, he's the youngest, and they just announced that they're going to have a child. So niece, niece slash nephew number 14. Coming in hot. Yeah. So this is kind of the... The last, last hurrah. last hurrah. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to work our way from North to South this time, but nice. yeah. And so are you, how long are you going for? Two weeks? Two weeks. Okay. And, um, flying into where? Uh, Milan this time. Okay. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't flown in there yet. So we'll, we'll start out in Milan. We'll hit, uh, we'll hit Parma. He actually, so he did a part of the Camino trail last summer mm-hmm. and met some people that live in Bologna. So we're going to go hang out with them for a little bit. He has a friend that has a small winery in Grottoli, so we'll spend some time there. And then we'll we'll shoot south and stay with the cousins. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool. The Jeep. How awesome is that? <laughs> it was it was wild. Yeah. Yeah. Did they get a picture in the Jeep at the time? No, uh, there yeah, there are I still yeah, I have those pictures. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and I I had my laptop and so you know, we we looked at pictures and found some people that so his his wife's sister lived across town and they have six kids who all live in California. So they spoke pretty good English. Yeah. So between my very bad Italian and their English, we, you know, we got you along pretty well. Yeah. We looked at pictures <laughs> and reminisced and, and, yeah. and food and yeah, nice. it was great. So then you like Italian food, obviously. 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 I feel like you would not be allowed in yeah. the country. Well, we, I mean, we grew up that way too, right? My, my great grandparents came over from Italy and, you know, just had a, grew up in a big Italian family. Yeah. Cooking. I've been, cooking for a long time and you're the cook in your house mostly yeah i'm not i'm not saying my wife can't cook she's a very good cook (laughs) she is she's a very good cook but i i but i really enjoy it i really do yeah and the stuff you like to cook generally is the italian food or Mm -hmm. um but you 
you know, we do, do a lot of bread, a lot of pizza, a lot of different pastas. Yeah. Yeah. Are you making your own pasta? Yeah. Do you I have do. like, you have a. I do. I have a little machine. copper hand crank. Yeah. yeah. You have to do it by hand. Yeah. As in Small yeah. batches. I made my own sourdough pasta a while ago and, um, but I like don't, I don't have a hand crank or anything. Yeah. So I just rolled it. And so it was a little uneven, shall we say, but it was delicious. Sure. Well, if you do it, you got a nice big table here. You could roll out a big tagliatelle and there you go. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe so. Um, well, maybe we should do a change your format up a little bit and do a cooking class. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I've had a couple people. Colin's pasta days. Yes. Well, I've had a couple people ask me to teach sourdough class, Ooh. and so. I know you did that for a group of guys. I did. Yeah, we've got a we, we have a little sourdough cult in the gym now yeah. too, <laughs> which is its own thing. Um, it is. And but you put whey in yours. No. No. What do you? There's something you put in yours that's extra that I don't. It's oh, higher protein. Why well, I, I use it to me one time. I use Caputo double out flour. No. No. No, there was something one time you told me with the higher protein content, content, and I was like, I'm sorry, you do what? And it might have been, maybe it wasn't whey. Hmm. Maybe it wasn't. Oh, like rye flour for the starter? No, that's fine. Rye flour on the starter with the natural yeast makes sense, but I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure either, and maybe it was in reference to making pizza dough. Do you put something extra in I, You know, dough? any... Oh, uh, I used to. But anymore, I, I use my sourdough for everything. Yeah. For pizza dough, too. Yeah, same. Yeah. And that's why I think at the time you were doing something. Yeah, what What was that? I don't know. It was something adding to the protein, though. Oh, it was gluten. No. No, that, but that's that's what I was putting in. Okay. It was gluten. Yeah. And maybe I totally misremember this conversation, but <laughs> probably, possibly. Yeah the, old, yeah, the old bread recipe. The old, yeah, the old pizza dough recipe. Yeah. Put gluten in it. Whereas mine... My pizza dough recipe is literally just essentially my bread recipe. Yep. But I flatten it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. I take it, I divide it in half. Half becomes a loaf of bread. Yeah. And the then other you get half. two pizza doughs out of it. Yeah. yeah. And then what I like to do lately is I just par bake them and throw them in the freezer for when I need them. Because then, like, I don't necessarily always make it fresh. Mm -hmm. But then I have pizza, pizza crust in the oven when I just want to pull it out and make something. Yeah. Works pretty well. Yeah, you can roll them out real thin, leave them on the counter overnight, let them get a little bit stale, and then freeze them. And then you have the like a perfect thin crust, thin crust crackery dough. Ooh, that sounds really good. You should good. give that a shot. Yeah, that sounds because I like yeah. the really thin. I like that, the crackery stuff where it's like almost crispy. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try that. Yeah, try that. So, yeah, welcome to the sourdough cult <laughs> that is <laughs> Nevada <Nevin> Farvel. <laughs> It's fine. It's good. It's it, you'll never go back to store bought yeah. bread. Ever. Well, you know, gym people are funny. We we have addictive personalities. Yeah. And yeah. And sourdough is one of those things. It is. It is. It's one of those. Yes, it is. It's fine. There's, the labor of love. There's worse hobbies to have. Bread with extra steps. Yes, worse <laughs> hobbies to have. Anyways, is there anything else you would like to leave people with? Yeah, you know, fitness is important. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter where you get it. Motion is lotion. Motion is lotion. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, keep moving. Doesn't matter your age. Doesn't Gardening matter. is exercise. You it know? is. Yeah, it doesn't, Just get out there. It doesn't have to be um, in a gym or a formal setting. Not at all. At all. Yeah. It's just um, do something today that will your tomorrow you will thank you for, essentially, is kind of what it is. And whatever you're going to stick to to move we're built to move yeah so just go do that um yeah i like do that it. stay active enjoy the summer yeah um if people want to find out more information about nevada barbell where should they go well we have a web page it Still, is we do what nevada barbell.com oh yeah instagram nevada ia barbell yes facebook nevada barbell yeah, I don't know why Nevada Barbell was already taken on Instagram, <laughs> on Instagram and not Facebook, but Nevada IA Barbell. And also not the URL. Weird. Yeah. And if you want to shoot me an email, it's Nevada IA Barbell at gmail.com. It's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Okay. Keep it real consistent across all those. Yeah. <laughs> That's super easy. Consistency is key to everything. 
Especially exercise <laughs> <laughs> and marketing and marketing <laughs> exercise. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you for taking the time to sit down and have a chat with me today. Well, yeah, let's uh, let's get together outside of podcasting. Maybe we'll see you around the gym soon. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I said maybe. <laughs> There's one across the street that I don't even attend. So. Yeah. Well, we'll see you at Collins Days. There you go. That one's for sure. And I'll be there at Lincoln Highway Days. So anyways, thank you. This was good.